the 9614th meeting of the Security Council is resumed. I wish to remind all speakers to limit their statements to no more than four minutes in order to enable this council to carry out its work expeditiously. The flashing light on the collars of the microphones will prompt speakers to bring their remarks to a close after four minutes. I now give the floor to the representative of Israel. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister of Malta for originally convening this important annual open debate. As conflict-related sexual violence remains an underreported phenomenon across the world, it is vital that the Council continues to meet and discuss new trends and ongoing challenges in the global fight against CRSV. I would also like to reiterate Israel's strong support for the mandate of SRSG Patton and her team of experts and express Israel's gratitude for the important work that the SRSG and her team have been doing for women and girls across the world, including for women and girls in Israel. Each year, the Secretary General's report on conflict-related sexual violence reminds the international community how urgent a task it is to end sexual violence as a weapon of war and as a tool of terrorism. For Israel, the report plays two important roles in this global fight. First, the report ensures that the abhorrent crimes committed against women and girls, as well as against men and boys, are not left in the shadows of history. It is all too often the case that survivors of CRSV are not believed, in this regard, Israel sees the report as an important milestone in the survivors' fight for justice. This has been all the truer for Israeli women and girls. As the international community turned a blind eye on Israeli women and girls and the stories of victims and survivors of the heinous sexual and gender-based crimes committed by Hamas on October 7th were neglected and even dehumanized. We thank the special representative and her team for standing up for all women and girls, regardless of their nationality, and for shedding light on those who the world did not want to see. Second, the report not only constitutes an important historical record of CRSV crimes, but it is an indispensable tool to address CRSV through sanctions. Therefore, the report warrants that the international community start taking steps towards accountability. For this reason, Israel was shocked and disappointed with the fact that Hamas, the instigator and perpetrator of the October 7th massacre, which included numerous acts of sexual and gender-based violence, was not mentioned in the annex list. The exclusion of this terror organization from the list of parties credibly suspected of committing or being responsible for patterns of CRSV sends the wrong message to the perpetrators. Moreover, weapons are still being supplied to Hamas, weapons we know are being used against the Israeli women, including young women who are still being held in Gaza. Madam President, the demilitarization and disarmament of Hamas, as well as the de-radicalization of the Gaza Strip through education for peace and coexistence, are key to ensure the abhorrent crimes carried out on October 7th will not be committed again against the women and girls in Israel and beyond. There will be no peace as long as children are taught to hate. As for the allegations of misconduct against Palestinians in detention mentioned in the report, these allegations have regretfully been made in a clear attempt to balance Hamas's crimes with Israeli misconduct, as CRSV was never part of the conflict prior to Hamas's brutal and atrocious attack. Nonetheless, Israel is a transparent democracy with all necessary mechanisms to evaluate any claims of misconduct. Such allegations are reviewed by the Israel in accordance with the robust procedures and instruments it has in place for this purpose. Madam President, many in this room have called to end impunity and strengthen accountability. Now it is time for the international community to turn those words into reality. We call upon the Council to add standalone listing criteria related to conflict-related sexual violence, to designate Hamas as a terrorist organization, and to call for the immediate release of all hostages. As Jews in Israel and around the world celebrate Passover, the holiday in which the Jewish people were freed from slavery, we pray for our people to be released from Gaza. Bring them all home now. I thank you. I thank the representatives of Israel for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Montenegro. Thank you. Dear Madam Chair, honorable delegates, at the outset I wish to stress that Montenegro fully aligns itself with the statements delivered by the European Union and the Group of Friends for WPS and UN LGBTI core group and want to make additional remarks in our national capacity. On the very beginning, I would like to thank Malta for organizing this important discussion and to Ms. Pramila Paten, Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, for her detailed briefing. As we gather for the open debate of the Security Council on Conflict-Related Sexual Violence, 
it is paramount to address disproportionate and unique gendered impacts of weapons, acknowledging that women constitute fewer than one third of participants in multilateral disarmament meetings. This underrepresentation underscores the urgent need to prioritize women's full and meaningful participation in arms control and disarmament efforts. Montenegro has been steadfast in its commitment to promoting gender equality and preventing conflict-related sexual violence. We recognize the importance of aligning with international frameworks, such as Resolution 1325, which calls for the protection of women and girls from gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, and Resolution 2122, which emphasize women's involvement in arms control at all decision-making levels. Our achievement in this realm are evident through the adoption of the strategy of the implementation of Security Council Resolution, Women, Peace, Security, and related resolutions for the period 2023-2027. This strategic document outlines over, over our overarching goal of advancing the position of women and girls in peace and security processes. It also includes operational objectives and an action plan aimed at strengthening gender equality in security sectors, increasing the representation of women in institutions and preventing all forms of discrimination and violence. Montenegro has actively collaborated with international partners, including the UNDP and OSCE mission. In diverse activities, such as media training, administrative capacity building, and combating hate speech and violence, our collaborative projects extended to gender responsive budgeting recognize as a vital tool in fostering gender equality. Furthermore, our alignment with the UN program of action to prevent, combat, and eradicate the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons has been instrumental in conducting gender and age-related assessments and data collection, enhancing the gender responsiveness of our national arms control policies and legislation. In conclusion, Montenegro remains committed to preventing conflict-related sexual violence, promoting gender equality and upholding human rights. Through robust collaborations, legislative frameworks and capacity-building initiatives, we strive to create a safer and more equitable world for all, where every individual, irrespective of gender, enjoys equal opportunities and rights. I thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Montenegro for their statement, and I'll give the floor to the representative of Cyprus. Madam President, we express our appreciation to Malta for organizing this debate. Allow me also to thank the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conf Conflict, Mr. Mrs. Pr Pramila Pattern, for her insightful presentation, and Mrs. Ahmadi and Mrs. Gurira for their valuable inputs. Cyprus fully subscribes to the statement of the European Union. Madam President, it is a sad reality that conflict-related sexual violence is entrenched in warfare. CRSV is not an isolated activity. It is deeply rooted in historical inequalities and patriarchal so social structures, exacerbated by the proliferation of arms and increased militarization. Victims and survivors are often living ashamed in the shadow, awaiting justice and redress when the culture of impunity unfortunately prevails. Cyprus strongly condemns gender-based violence in all its forms, and manifestations online and offline, including all acts of sexual violence during armed conflicts. Security Council Resolution 1325 recognized that sexual violence is a peace and security issue. Security Council Resolution 1820 recognized sexual violence as a weapon and tactic of war, stressing the importance of ending impunity of such acts. Despite the adoption of this, these two landmark Security Council resolutions, it is deeply alarming that in conflict-affected regions around the world, conflict-related sexual violence is still used as a tactic of war, torture, and terrorism. Cyprus recalls that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute a war crime, a crime against humanity, or a const constitutive act of with respect to genocide. CRSV is a peace and security issue and an impediment to restoration of peace requiring specific operational and policy responses. Madam President, proliferation of weapons, particularly small arms and light weapons, are factors that have been recognized as contributors to sexual violence in conflict. However, little has been done in addressing these factors so to prevent CRSV. Allow me to add some points in today's discussion. First, arms control and disarmament instruments are critical tools of prevention. 
a gender-responsive implementation of arms control has a substantial role to play in preventing CRSV and reducing the proliferation of weapons facilitating conflict-related sexual violence. Second, we lack specific data to better understand the link between weapons and especially small arms and light weapons and CRSV. It is crucial to support the collection of more disaggregated data as well as to pursue and fund specific research on the link between SALW and CRSV. This data and research will assist us in elaborating more targeted policy, legislative and implementation frameworks with special emphasis also on prevention efforts. Third, Women and girls are disproportionately affected by sexual violence, yet not fully included in the key decision-making structures related to peace and security. In this regard, concrete measures to secure the full, equal, meaningful, and safe participation of women at all levels of decision-making on peace and security, including in decision-making regarding security issues, is a sine qua non. Madam President, as a country that has experienced the atrocity of CRSV firsthand, Cyprus attaches great importance to the elimination of all forms of gender-based violence. We pledge to continue working with the international community to protect and empower women, girls, men and boys in all their diversity in conflict-related situations, strengthening the global response to conflict-related sexual violence. It is more important than ever to strengthen the global response against this heinous crime, adopt a survivor-centered approach while at the same time ensure justice and accountability for all we victims and survivors. I thank you. I thank the representative of Cyprus for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Liberia. We thank the Republic of Malta for convening this important debate. We also like to commend SRSG Patton and the briefers for their insightful briefs depicting the dire and dehumanizing conditions of defenseless women and girls trapped in conflict zones around the world, while stressing the need for urgent and concrete measures aimed at addressing increased conflict-related sexual violence and other atrocious acts committed with impunity during armed conflicts. Liberia reaffirms its commitment to Resolution 1325, which calls for all parties to armed conflict to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, including rape and other forms of sexual abuse, as well as its commitment to the principles of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, particularly as they relate to addressing conflict-related sexual violence. We are aware that conflict-related sexual violence is a grave violation of human rights, often carried out during times of conflict. This tragic and pervasive aspect of conflict leaves lasting scars on individuals, families, and communities long after the fighting has ended. Although the guns have been silenced in my country for about 20 years, the adverse effect of the war still lingered on. Now in today's reality, the escalation of conflicts makes it increasingly urgent to implement resolutions on CRSV, conventions on arms proliferation, enforcing the arms treaty, trade treaty, as well as the application of international laws to prevent this scourge and protect women and girls. There is a need to holistically review instruments and frameworks that focus on CRSV prevention, promotion to protect women and girls, and to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. Liberia firmly believes that ensuring accountability is paramount. Perpetrators of sexual violence must be held responsible through thorough investigations and legal actions. We must also create safe spaces for reporting incidents and ensuring that survivors feel safe and supported when coming forward, providing them with justice and reparations.
my country strongly believes that addressing gender inequality, training of security personnel, community engagement, accountability, and responsiveness can serve as a deterrent to the pervasive acts of violence against women and girls. In conclusion, let us recommit ourselves to the principles of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and work tirelessly to end conflict-related sexual violence. The time for action is now, and we must act urgently to protect the rights and dignity of all individuals, especially women and girls affected by conflict. I thank you. I thank the representative of Liberia for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, my delegation wishes first and foremost to convey our gratitude to the Republic of Malta for having organized this public, this open debate on conflict-related sexual violence through demilitarization and taking into account the gender perspective. This is an opportunity for us to give thought to this emerging issue, which is related to the systematic use by non-state and state actors of sexual violence as a tactic of war, of torture, and of terrorism in armed conflict. I wish to take this opportunity to applaud the ongoing efforts undertaken by Madam Pramila Patton, Special Representative of the Secretary General, with the support of her office uh, 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 and the, on, the, for the efforts to counter CRSV. We also wish to take this opportunity to welcome the statement delivered by Madam Danai Gurira, Goodwill Ambassador of UN Women, who highlighted the devastating plight of women and children in the east of the DRC. Madam President, it is most unfortunate to observe the fact that CRS, that sexual violence is associated with armed conflict, and particularly in the DRC, this kind of violence has been used systematically for decades as a weapon of war and for the destruction of social fabric and human dignity. Congolese women have lost human dignity. Many of them have endured rape, sexual violence, and other cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment, particularly in mining areas. This is a situation that is exacerbated by insufficient repression of perpetrators, exacerbated per by the proliferation of uh, weapons and armed groups, which are fueled by the plunder of natural resources of the DRC, which is uh, with the complicity of neighboring countries. This, in, this is the case of the M23 movement with support of the Rwandan Defense Forces. It is high time for the Security Council to unanimously condemn the situation and to work to definitively bring an end to these atrocities to ensure that this time justice will be rendered. Madam President, despite this situation, the DRC has been undertaking significant efforts. With the support of our partners, our efforts are geared towards the establishment of a normative and institutional framework to help provide protection to victims of CRSV and to ensure justice and reparations. I wish to take this opportunity to highlight the progress we have made and to share our best practices. Inter alia, we have a revised national strategy to counter gender-based violence. We have a zero tolerance policy for perpetrators of rape. This was launched in 2021. We have the Kinshasa agreements on positive masculinity to eliminate violence against women and girls. We have a program for disarmament, demobilization, community recovery and stabilization. And we have established a national fund for reparation for the survivors of, of conflict-related sexual violence and survivors of other grave crimes in the DRC. We also have a national five-year action plan for the years 2024 to 2028 to control small arms and light weapons. And we have established a task force to ensure follow-up and assessment of this project. And we have also established a national commission for transitional justice. 
Madam President, to conclude, I wish to stress that my government stands ready to continue to work in full transparency with all bilateral and multilateral partners to end this scourge. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I now give the floor to the representative of Myanmar. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I thank the Presidency of Mortal for organizing this annual open debate on preventing conflict-related sexual violence with specific focus on demilitarization and gender responsive and control. I also appreciate all briefers for their comprehensive insights. Convening of this annual open debate comes at a timely moment when women and girls are continuously endangered by gender-based violence in the form of sexual violence, particularly in, a, in various conflicting settings. Increase of CRSV across the world is alarming. We, we heard loud and speaker, loud and clear of the appeal of the briefers. It is the member states' responsibility to protect women and girls from CRSV by taking effective action in a timely manner. In this regard, the UN Security Council can play a bipolar role by using all available tools to protect them. Madam President, Myanmar unequivocally condemns CRSV and all forms of violence against women and girls at anywhere under any circumstance. Since the illegal military coup in Myanmar in February 2021, the military hunters atrocities and serious violations of human rights, including CRSV against innocent civilians, are more visible, more systematic, more coordinated, and more extensive. Women and youth have been targeted by the military hunter throughout the illegal coup because of their active participation in the revolution against the military hunter. For so many decades, the Myanmar military has been known for using rape as a weapon of war. Now, women human rights defenders are facing greater risk of all forms of violence, particularly the use of sexual violence as a tactic of war by the military hunter. Before our very own eyes, Myanmar military's possession of weaponry has only proven its ambition to commit CRSP, massacres, crimes against humanity, and war crimes against the civilians. The military hunters' atrocities and CRSV are well documented by the UN and the other international organizations, so I will not repeat here. Due to the military hunters' various atrocities, the people have faced numerous sufferings. Over 2.8 million people became internally displaced. Almost 19 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. Over 85,000 homes have been burned down and destroyed. Those sufferings were exacerbated further by the military hunters' recent and lawful forced conscription. To avoid forced conscription, many youth, including girls, are hiding and fleeing from the country. Madam President, the National Unity Government, together with ethnic resistance organizations and the people of Myanmar, have put our utmost efforts to protect women and girls and pe prevent them from CISB. We all are working together to, the, to end the military dictatorship and build a federal democratic union. The NUG issued the Military Code of Conduct for People's Defense Forces in March this year. It includes, among others, People's Defense Forces share respect international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Violators shall be seriously charged in accordance with the existing laws, shall not physically, mentally, and sexually assault any civilian. Such a code of conduct is communicated to the forces on the ground. Madam President, in conclusion, the National Unity Government, together with EROs and CSO, are trying its best to prevent women and girls from CISP despite various challenges and limitations. But we still need effective support from the international community and the member states to protect our women and girls. Therefore, we repeatedly appeal to the international community, specifically, especially the UN Security Council member states, as follows. To cut flows of many 
weapons and legitimacy to the military hunter. To provide humanitarian aid directly to those in need through all available channels, including cross-border aid, in a sustainable and predictable manner. To provide us effectively political, diplomatic, and financial support. To help us build our capability to end military dictatorship and to end impunity of the military forces by referring the Myanmar situation to ICC. It is also critically important to bring justice to the victims of the military hunters' atrocities, including CRSV. We must bring these perpetrators accountable through justice. Their enjoyment of blanket impunity must end. By doing so, it will help prevent from a recurrence of such atrocities and CRSV in Myanmar. I thank you. I thank the representative of Myanmar for the statement, and I will give the floor to the representative of Argentina. Señora Presidente. Madam President, throughout history, sexual violence has been used as a weapon of war, and often as a deliberate strategy in conducting hostilities. Since the adoption of Resolution 1820, of the Security Council, there has been increasing public awareness about these crimes and their consequences. Sexual violence perpetuates conflict and instability. Its long-term destructive nature has devastating effects, not only on the survivors of this crime, but also on whole communities. Conflict-related sexual violence is deeply rooted in gender inequality and is a complex phenomenon with multiple overlapping causes. Therefore, addressing it requires a multiple focus, which works on long-term structural prevention and also on more operative short-term prevention to tackle and mitigate the immediate causes. The increase in armed conflict and the proliferation of weapons are two related strands feeding into systematic and widespread sexual violence in conflict. Above and beyond merely recognizing this, however, little has been done to tackle the proliferation of weapons as part of the efforts undertaken to prevent conflict-related sexual violence. The proliferation of weapons and the illicit trafficking of weapons increase the use of sexual violence by armed groups, organised crime and terrorist groups. Most of the incidents of conflict-related sexual violence involve firearms, which are used to intimidate, coerce, injure and kill civilians through, through rape, kidnapping, forced marriage and other forms of sexual violence. Efficient regulation of weapons could strengthen the prevention of conflict-related sexual violence. Control and disarmament reduce the proliferation of arms, the arms which facilitate such crimes, and this would lead to a climate which is more propitious for building peace. Despite the numerous international instruments which call for the protection of civilians against attacks of a sexual nature in armed conflict, and which recognise that such acts could constitute war crimes, uh, conflict-related sexual violence continues to prevail with a culture of almost total impunity. Accountability of perpetrators of acts of sexual violence is vital to do justice to the victims and to deter future such crime. This, these crimes are fall under individual criminal responsibility in international law and states have the primary obligation of prosecuting their perpetrators. When a state is unwilling or unable to investigate and prosecute international crimes, including conflict-related sexual violence, the international community should take the necessary measures to refer the situ situation to the International Criminal Court. The Rome Statute clearly criminalizes rape and any other form of sexual violence as war crimes and crimes against humanity. 
Madam President, we should not forget that during the attacks of the 7th of October last in Israel, numerous attacks of sexual violence were committed by members of the terrorist group Hamas. And we believe, therefore, that these acts should be explicitly condemned, both the acts and those responsible for them. The Republic of Argentina calls for the immediate release of hostages who are still held by Hamas and who are victims of sexual violence and other cruel, inhumane and degrading acts. To conclude, Madam President, we wish to recall that in 2015, led by Argentina and the United Kingdom, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 69-293 which proclaimed the 19th of June each year as the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, so as to raise awareness about the need to bring an end to conflict-related sexual violence and to honour the victims and survivors of sexual violence. I thank you. I thank the representative of Argentina for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ethiopia. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my delegation takes note of the report of the Secretary General, and my, my intervention will focus on the aspects of the annual report that has to do with my country, Ethiopia. Madam President, Ethiopia faced security challenges in the past few years. Currently, our path to pave the way for peace and stability is bearing encouraging outcomes. Parallel to these efforts, we have been continually addressing alleged violation of human rights, including violations of rights and crimes committed against women and children. The government of Ethiopia gives utmost attention to all allegations on violation of human rights, including those contained in the report presented for this meeting. We denounced all crimes, including sexual violence, committed in the context of conflict and we are steadfast in our efforts to prevent such crimes and to investigate when they are reported to ensure accountability and redress. Because any allegation deserves further inquiry, because every single violation is one too many, we are always committed to investigate any allegations despite the absence of any corroboration. Neither does Ethiopia concur with any of the allegations which, same as before, were never verified or brought to our attention to our attention for the necessary measure. Madam President, on this basis, I will share information on the measures taken by Ethiopia to address human rights violation in the context of conflict. These measures were already brought to the attention of the SRSG in the previous years. Nevertheless, the report and analysis of the SRSG continues to use sources that are not credible and do not in any way assist the ongoing efforts to ensure accountability and redress. This approach is not constructive, and we ask the SRSG to, to reconsider her approach and remove Ethiopia from the report. The national mechanisms we have put in place to ensure accountability and re redress for the heinous crimes of sexual violence are within Ethiopia's legal framework that denies statutory limitation, pardon or amnesty for such crimes. These mechanisms of accountability in the military justice system and the regular law enforcement already ensured accountability of individual perpetrators. More importantly, Ethiopia adopted a transitional justice policy with the objective of addressing crimes committed in the context of conflicts that occurred in the past years. In manifesting our commitment to the cause, we worked with several UN agencies in the process. Madam President, while there could be some challenges on the ground, I would like to register our rejection of the approach in propagating hostile activism that continues to be conducted on the floors of this August chamber. The primary responsibility to ensure respect, protection, and fulfillment of human rights resides with states. Politicization of human rights, double standard, and selectivity only lead to irreparable damage to the credibility of the international system and undermine the cooperation with national institutions. In closing, Madam President, I would like to underscore, Ethiopia condemns any violation of human rights. 
and crimes, including crimes of sexual violence. We also remain steadfast in ensuring accountability and redress. No allegation will go unheard, uninvestigated, and unpunished after due process of law. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Ethiopia for their statement. There are no more speakers inscribed on the list. The meeting is adjourned.